This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Lewis Raymond Taylor. How are we, Lewis? I'm good. I've been looking forward to this. You're uh, a little bit like a cup of tea on a cold English day. Easy to talk to, relaxed. I've had a a little bit more aggressive um, interview style recently with a few people. And it's, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a bit of a breath of fresh air today to have a chat today and just two geezers down the pub kind of thing, you know? Yeah, talking shit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... Netflix documentary that's went everywhere. The psychopath yeah. life coach. Yeah, um, you don't seem a bit of a psychopath. I've interviewed psychopaths. I've, I believe there's a, is it four different levels to being a psychopath. What was yours? Anti behaviour, antisocial personality disorder, uh-huh. and that was the, the diagnosis. And then you can label someone a psychopath based on that. But mm-hmm. a psychopath isn't actually a diagnosable term. It's got too much stigma to it. So it's more just a a label, like calling yeah. someone a psycho or well, actually that's the exact same thing. But calling somebody a monster or you know they're not they're not yeah. mental health conditions, but people yeah. label them. Watch the documentary. I loved that. I, I enjoyed it. It's my kind of this is my kind of conversation. The majority of people aren't of your fucking nutcases. You're yeah. no different. <laughs> yeah. I'm no different. Everybody's, I believe, got a bit of psycho in them. Everybody's got a bit of narcissism in them. Everybody gets crazy from time to time. But I believe everybody's also got a bit of goodness in them as well. Of course. So, and not many people admit it as well. I think yeah. that's half the problem. Like I say, enjoyed that. You became a successful businessman. Uh, I listen to a lot of controversy around it, which we'll touch on. But first, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, Lewis, where you grew up, how it all began. Of course. Yeah, I mean, I've shared this story a lot. I mean, it's in the documentaries. I don't know how deep you want to go. Um, stop me if I'm, you know, going on too much. Um, but it started off with quite an abusive dad. Put me down a lot, called me a buffoon, tell me you never amount to anything, you're stupid. And then I created this identity that I was bad and unlovable. Didn't realize that at the time, of course. No young kids like, oh, I'm, you know, I've got an internal void for significance and love. Um, but I did create this identity that I was bad and then it, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy because then I did bad things and then that led to more labels and more people telling me I was bad. Um, so it started there, you know, he would be, he would be violent towards me every now and again, not like he was beating me every day, but enough for me to be like, you know, this is causing me some damage. Um, and then because I wasn't getting the love at home, because also my mum was very emotionally detached, I went and become... I decided I wanted to be famous, but didn't necessarily want to be famous for anything particular, acting, singing, dancing, anything I could do, could do. And my mum and dad would provide for me like that. We were um, brought up in a council estate um, just outside uh, Watford in uh, Hertfordshire, but it wasn't. We weren't particularly poor. And my mum and dad both worked, and they provided for me these acting, these singing, these dancing. You know, they they did look after me in that respect. Just more of that emotional nurturing that wasn't there. And I did this acting, singing, and dancing. It kind of gave me something. I enjoyed it. It was giving me that significance that I was looking for. And then, come eleven years old, sexually abused. So that completely derailed that. And that was when I was going into secondary school. So I was like, mm, it's another thing that's not working. Put that to bed. I had to create a new identity. 
again, it's not something you're cognitively aware of when you're 11 years old, like, oh, it's time to start a new identity and fill this internal void, <laughs> you know, but um, that's what I did. You know, in hindsight, I can, I can look back at it and understand a little bit about my journey and how it unfolded that way. And then I just turned into a little shit, really, you know, typical, I say typical, but for me it was typical, but light and fires, criminal damage, shoplifting, had an asthma at 14, I was expelled from school at 15. Um, and yeah, things just got progressively worse from there, really. How were you at school? Before, How was I? Before the abuse? Obviously you were getting the beatings from your dad. I was always is... naughty. Like even like when I was in nursery, there was a take, come to see your child at nursery day. And apparently all the kids were sitting on the carpet and there was me in a Superman costume banging a drum. You know, I was just always been a bit disruptive. Well, a bit. I've always been very disruptive. I couldn't quite understand those behavioral norms and didn't respect authority that's actually why i got uh, expelled from school it actually said refusing to accept the authority of staff for some reason i couldn't quite grasp the level of i should listen to this person and i should respect this person and it just didn't seem to register with me properly but the abuse from the father who should be loving caring nurturing mm. that's where you're going because you weren't conditioned with those labels you weren't born with those labels it's the same as every bad man and you every gangster every shooter every drug lord every bank robber everyone was bullied or abused mm. every single one there's not one that's come on here with a loving family <laughs> yeah. instead there's they've all there's all the telltale signs of the abandonment mm. and abandonment's so crucial i know you've got a newborn which we'll touch on same as myself but it's that skin to skin it's that the cry out method used to be back in the day let them cry they'll figure it out that's bullshit abandonment issues stem from then mm. the six years seven years of the progress of a kid like from going through the bullying from your dad and the beatings, that ain't normal. That's mm. going to scar you for life. And that then creates that character of misbehaving, in mm. my own opinion. I'm not a therapist, but I understand people well now because I interview so many cool, fucking people. Yeah. But it's the scars it leaves on the soul of not feeling good enough, not feeling important, not feeling loved. Is it me? It's the problem. It was your dad that was a fucking problem. Mm. He was a psychopath. Mm. You know, you're a father now, so you, you would know now not how could anybody hurt something so innocent, mm, so pure. It's true. Yeah. It's an, it's disgusting. And but that was the way back then. Mm. Because of our own heads were fried back then. There was fights and domestic violence and everybody kicking fuck out each other, babies getting battered, kids getting mm. battered. Because they didn't know how there was no self control then. Yeah. It was I don't know if it's as bad now, but I, I know back in the day it was it was fucking ruthless. Yeah, well I know that he had a bad relationship with I mean he never really spoke about his family or anything really, but I know every now and again he would slip and he would tell me a bit of information. I know that his mum died at sixteen. I know he said he hated his dad. And I know that he cut off from all of his family. So he was, all I knew was my mum's side of my family and my dad. Mm -hmm. So there's some trauma there that he's never shared. So I can understand that there's some sort of generational trauma that's sort of getting relayed down. It's our responsibility now, I guess, to draw a line in the sand and kind of make sure that doesn't continue, you know? Hot people, hot people. Yeah, 100%. How bad were the beatings? I'd say they weren't that bad, you know. Uh, I don't know if I was conditioned to think they're normal, but you know, it's not like he came in every day with an iron and smashed my head in or anything or a belt. It, you know, it, normally it would be the verbal stuff, you know, but that hurt the most, to be honest. The one word that sticks out is the buffoon. I didn't even know what it meant at the time. I actually thought it was a baboon. So I thought this whole, like my whole life, he was calling me like a, a stupid monkey, you know, <laughs> when actually a buffoon is like, I don't know, a jester. And, you know, I don't know, I, don't know, I still don't know now. But the way he used to say it is like, you are a buffoon. I just felt it. Yeah, that was the worst out of everything. Um, but yeah, he'd sit on top of me and hit me. But I always used to remember he used to try and stop himself. You know, he'd be like hitting me, but pulling his arm back. You know, he didn't want to hit me, but he just couldn't help it because he's an angry man. Very angry. Like his veins would burst out of his head. He would just look like a, an exploding robot. I'm writing a book at the moment that I wrote in there. You know, he would remind me of an exploding robot. Like he would just, sh he'd have a short fuse and it'd just go. He's scary. You know, he, and he looked like a big man back then. You know, I'm technically probably taller than him now, but six foot two, tall, big fat, you know, probably 18 or stone man. Looking up at that, it was, uh, yeah, it was scary at the time, but the beatings weren't bad. I, di I didn't walk away with any like significant bruises or broken bones or anything like that, but it was enough to cause me effect because the way I saw it was, because I remember I was getting older and I thought I can, I can probably, I've got a chance here. I could probably do some damage, but I can't, like I feel frozen. And I don't want to hit you because you're my dad and I love you. So why would I want to hit you? And then that made me think, well, if, 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 if you're hitting me, then that must mean you can't love me. You know, and it's just this reinforcement of being this bad, unlovable kid that I've been told by everybody my whole life. And it just kept on, yeah, reinforcing that further and further throughout my journey. 
What was the one thing you craved from your dad? <sighs> Just love, really, when it all boils down to it. Um, Do you know what love was? I don't think so, no. It's not like I said I want my dad to love me, but I was, I had... I call it like an internal void. There was something missing that I was looking for because I wasn't getting it from mum or dad. Mum showed it to me. Um, she would provide for me, but she wasn't from like an emotionally, I love you, let me give you a cuddle kind of background. My, my granddad was in the military and all that sort of thing. So that that just era wasn't as lovey-dovey as it is now. So I didn't get it from mum, didn't get it from dad, so I just wasn't getting it. So I just didn't have any love in terms of feeling it. And there is an argument that maybe they were showing it to me or giving it to me, but I, maybe I didn't, I wasn't able to receive it due to this personality disorder. There's also always this um, conversation around um, nature or nurture. You know, was I born like this or was this a product of my environment or is this a combination of the two? But there is a possibility that they could have been loving me, but I just didn't know how to feel it. So as, as far as I'm concerned, there's something not in there that I need. And then I'm on this quest to find it. And that's where the, you know, the criminality came in because it kind of filled it to a certain extent. The abuse at 11 years old, I know it's a difficult one to talk about, yeah. but it's important as well because it helps other people who's maybe yeah. men we bottle it up the most. One in four people, one in four kids on this planet are sexually abused, one in four. Wow. And the majority of them don't speak about it. Yeah, and especially men. Yeah, and men are, are the ones who struggle the most. I had a man on yesterday, Crazy Steve, um, not a case, and out of prison, abused, bossed to at 11 years old, always embarrassed and shamed because he says, I'm not gay and this and that, but he was just battling with that internal voice in his head mm. and he's, he's just released a book speaking about it. Mm. That strength, that then takes away the pain and gives you your energy back and gives you your some sort of inner strength where they don't have that control over you. When did it start? It was only a one-off thing. I say only. I think I sort of devalue my story quite a lot because I've shared it quite a lot, and it's normal for me. It's my internal map, you know. It's what I've lived through, so it doesn't seem as significant to me anymore. But I started doing. Um, I can't remember if I ever mentioned a minute ago, but because I wasn't getting this love, at, oh yeah, I did. Because I wasn't getting this love at home, I had this internal void, and I thought, ah. You know, maybe if I'm famous, I'll better get it. So I started doing this acting, singing, and dancing. Um, didn't particularly like any one of them. I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like I want to be an actor. I want to be a singer. I want to be a dancer. It was just, I want to be famous from the age of uh, ten. Probably started at seven, actually. And for three or four years, I used to do these acting, singing, and dancing things. I was in plays. I did everything, even as uh, I even did ballet and tap dance at one point. You saw in the documentary, right? This is kind of because I've always had this extreme behaviour. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it like in an extreme way so i'm not just gonna dance i'll be a ballet <laughs> be a ballerina and um i went to this stage school and it was an older guy invited me back to his house i knew there was an age gap but i just thought he was an older lad on, on reflection you can look back and think oh, how big was that age gap you know and i still don't know and i still don't know what his intentions were uh whether or not it was a one-off whether or not he did it deliberately whether or not he was just a gay lad but to cut long story short i went around his house stayed around his house that night it was on a bunk bed it was at his mum's house how old was he it's hard to say but i would say um, probably i was 11 he was probably 18. Mm. i probably thought it was less though i think i think i thought he was maybe 15. he was like the cool older kid that was smoking weed and i was like oh yeah cool um Anyway, who knows how old he was? You really can't tell, can you, really? Especially at that age. You know, the perception of ages is difficult to, to tell. But um, I was, I don't know how this happened, but we was watching TV and I'd sort of dangled, I was on the top bed and I sort of dangled my arm over the, the bunk bed and then he grabbed my hand. And I was just like, what the fuck is he doing? But you're frozen. You just can't pull your hand away. So I just left it there. And then I'm like, <laughs> you know, minutes are passing. I'm like, I'm still holding this geezer's hand. Um... And just escalated to the point where then the next thing you know, he's creeping up the top bunk. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And then I remember when my dad used to hit me, I used to freeze. You know, you've heard of it, fight, flight or freeze, right? And also in school, I was very leery, very cocky. I had this sort of, you know, mentality of I don't care, but didn't really have the courage to fight back because of, I think, my dad hitting me and not being able to hit him back. So I used to get jumped all the time and just lay on the floor and let people kick the shit out of me and then just stand up and be like, right, okay. So I was used to sort of freezing in that environment. And he, um, yeah, he came up in the top bunk, um, j jumped on, not jumped, but just got on top of me and started kissing the side of my face and the side of my neck and I just froze stiff. And then from there it turned into full sexual abuse. Now somewhere along that line, 
Still to this day, don't know why I did it, whether it was a survival mechanism, whether I thought it'd make it go quicker, whether or not, I, I don't know. But at some point during that, it's probably like 15 minutes in though, by the way, of being completely frozen, I decided, I must have made a decision, I'm going to participate. So I, so I ended up, you know, going, going through with it. And I think a lot of people that have experienced that will probably relate to that and go, oh, that's just what happens. Um, and then that's what brings up all the crazy questions after. Did I just instigate that did i did he know that's what was going to happen when i came around his house um if i did done something gay am i gay um all these questions and then it's just shut down so you got all these sort of things that are in your past that you're just suppressing and suppressing and to be honest i didn't tell anyone about it and i didn't even feel that bad about it it's not like i was sitting in the shower you know oh my god what's happened to me i've been raped or whatever which i hadn't been by the way i didn't i didn't, didn't go that far it was everything else other than that but um I kind of just buried it to the point where I didn't really feel it and it didn't really affect me in a in a conscious awareness sort of point of view. Of course, subconsciously, it was affecting me more than I was aware of. Do you think that's because you're so used to blocking trauma out? It was just another form of trauma where you've been used, you've been abused, it's just shut off and move on to the next day? I guess so. You know, I just didn't have any awareness around myself back then. I mean, late, much later on in life, like 10 years later, I remember I was in a, a rehab program and I put my hand up and I said, Miss, what do you do if you've got loads of problems, but you don't know what they are? <laughs> like, I, I didn't know what my problems were. I didn't know what my traumas were. I didn't know I was traumatized. I didn't know these things were bad things. I thought it was life. You know, I thought all parents must be like, like that. And I thought maybe those things happen from time to time or whatever. So... Yeah, I, I didn't process it, didn't understand it, and it, it was what it was. When did you start drinking? I mean, from an early age of probably 11, 12, down the park, you know, with your bottles of cider and all that sort of stuff. I used to obviously love that, but that wasn't a problem. It was only when I was getting to about 16 or 17 that I used to find myself drinking a lot and getting drunk. Um, but by 17, I was drinking like vodka, a lot of it, blacking out, and that was when it was becoming a like, problem and I was becoming violent as well. When does it kick in when you're the one, when the abuser, the one who's getting abused mm. then becomes the abuser? Yeah. When did that happen? When was that switch? Um, so a few, the few things happened along that journey. I kind of, I got, I got an ASBO, I got expelled from school. I got involved with crime. I went into a young offenders institution. And it was around that sort of time, the Young Offenders Institution, and also this this time I got ju I got jumped by a group of lads because I remember I used to got jumped. I used to get jumped all the time, and I didn't really see it as being like pussy or whatever and get beaten up. I saw it, I kind of liked it. I don't know, kind of liked the idea of eh, whatever, do what you want to me. It doesn't it doesn't bother me. Um, don't need to even fight back. But um, there was this one guy that jumped me, and then I found I saw him in a in a nightclub, and I went up to him, and I didn't even mean to punch him. But my arm just came up and just hit him in the face, just randomly, it's just involuntary. I don't know if it was because I subconsciously wanted to do it or just ready to do it or I don't know, it was an impulse. Punched him in the face, we went into a fight, I won the fight, got kicked out and I just felt powerful. Um, you know, and, and same, same with prison, same with Young Offenders Institution, that forced me into an environment where I had to fight and had to, you know, not be a target and be vulnerable. So. Around about 18 years old, I started to learn to fight and realize I was powerful. This whole time I felt powerless, you know. I was frozen, these things were happening to me, there's nothing I could do about it. I was quite small, but I had this growth spurt where I became six foot two. Um, it was also, I'm not gonna act like I'm some fucking cage fighter or anything, because I'll get ripped in the fucking comments, but <laughs> I typically did quite good in fights, I don't know why. Uh, long arms or something, I don't know. But I'd win, I'd win some fights against some big guys and it just filled me up, I felt great. Um, and I also liked the reputation that came with that. I liked people saying, did you hear what Lewis did last night? Or Lewis did that, or Lewis did that. And that kind of gave me some form of significance, some form of love in a way. It obviously wasn't love, but it was the closest thing that I could experience to it. And it's not like I was going, if I punch a skeezer, I'm going to feel loved. But it was like, oh, I feel better. And we all do things that make us feel better. That's why we reach for you know, external substances or whatever it might be, anything that makes us feel better, we want to do more of. And especially if you've got an addictive personality or you are an addict, you know, depending on how you look at it, you'll, you'll abuse anything that makes you feel better. So for me, I, I believe I've become addicted to fighting. Like it was something that I craved, I looked for. Um, it, it's not like I was going out looking for people to attack. 
Well, actually, in a, in a sense, I guess I did, but I was doing it in sort of nightclubs and things like that. It's not like I was going through the street looking for an old lady or something like that. But I'd get, I'd be in the nightclub and I'd be the typical fucking idiot that's had too much to drink and it's just you know you, you don't you don't want to connect eyes because you know that it's going to kick off straight away. Um, and I and I enjoyed it. That's the truth at the time because it just made me feel a little bit more complete. Did you feel as if you were getting some sort of power back with being bullied and abused your whole life? Yeah, yeah, I did. When did you end up in the YOs? What age? 18 and 19. What was that for? Stole a van. Um, I did, well, I, I found a car key on the floor, pressed the button and it beep beep. <laughs> so I put it in my pocket and then got drunk and then remembered I had it and then went down and got the car and then didn't even know how to drive but ended up managing to sort of figure it out. Got caught by the police, had some weed on me and then went to Young Offenders for three months. Who was that? Um, it's interesting because it was uh, Wood Hill and it was a double A cat. I went to two A and it was it was full of you know people that had done serious crimes. You know? Yeah, why are you in double A cat with the murderers and yeah, yeah? Terrorists it's because and... it was the closest one to where I lived at the time, and it was like they they put you there and then they re re categorize you or whatever. But they put me there for the first month or whatever. And um, mate, there was there was people that were in there for uh, yeah. There was this one guy that was the top of the wing that I thought. That I was getting on with actually. Played pool with him, had showers with him. Um, he was 18 years old from Wales, supposed to be in there for killing a couple of geezers, and that was a good thing at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, you legend, you know. <laughs> and then uh, Googled his name when I got out. It turns out that he was homeless, and uh, he, some old some old lady who had just retired from doing like 50 years as a midwife, said, "Come, come on in. I'll I'll look after you tonight." And in the middle of the night, he tried to um, burgle her house. And while she caught him, so he stabbed her 30 times to death. You know, that was the kind of people I was knocking around with. And also, do you remember back in the day, there was those three lads from Liverpool who kicked some old man's head in through his helmet for a fiver? Not sure. Yeah, that was in the paper. They were in there. Hor some horrible people in there. And um, But it fucked me up a little bit because... Not a little bit. It did fuck me up because... I was so vulnerable in my mind that I was so susceptible to picking up other people's beliefs and behaviors. And I'd, I'd already sort of started this quest for significance and power that I thought that I was getting from these like street fights. And then when I'm going into jail, I'm now bot bottom of the pecking order and people saying, what are you in for? And I'm like, I'm still stealing a van. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm in it for murder. And I'm like, oh, I want to be in it for murder. <laughs> it's fucking mental. <laughs> That's kind of, I, I don't think I said I wanted to be in there for murder, but I definitely thought I want something a little bit more significant so I can come in here and, you know, be a bit more proud of my charges. It's fucking awful what you think yeah. about it. And uh, when I came out of prison, that was that was in the back of my mind, but also... I'd been given the worst punishment society had to offer and I didn't mind it. You know, the pe th people with personality disorders, whether they have one or not, they they don't really respond to punishment well for some reason. That's why 80% of the prison population have personality disorders um, because for whatever reason, yeah, they don't learn from their mistakes. And 80% of the prison population come from a broken home. Yeah, yeah. And that probably creates a personality <clears throat> disorder. Yeah, yeah. That's, it does. The kids aren't born with these sort of these labels that I believe anyway mm. it's pure they're souls they're, they're just bundles of joy that can be conditioned and programmed to be spectacular in life with the right love right guidance but nobody really knows what the fuck is going on especially back then I mean yeah. it's only now that we're sort of opening our minds up to personal development and the ways that we can learn about ourselves yeah. and our emotions but you know when, when even I was growing up and I'm not particularly you know I'm yet still young you know just wasn't in the curriculum, wasn't it? It still isn't now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole conversation I'd like to talk about at some point. But I think this, the schooling system is absolutely broken. Like it teaches us, you know, algebra and photosynthesis, and it, you know, it's a it's a pathway that will give you an option to get a job that will, you know, feed these large corporations that are all connected to the government. But it doesn't teach you about yourself and your mission and you and, and who you are and your why and your values and your emotions and what you really want to do with your life and it's just a huge gap for people to to understand themselves better and have better awareness because if i had awareness around what was going on for me i could have dealt with it but i didn't even know what was going on so yeah. how can you do with something you don't understand yeah the schooling system are creating soldiers yeah. to work for the big corporations they're not creating individuality free thinkers spirit-minded yeah. where you just see the world for yourself make your own mistakes yeah. learn from them but again i think a lot of people are waking up but again there's still a lot of people dumb down there's only three percent in this world to goal set three percent yeah three percent and we, if you, 
writing stuff down and goals <laughs> is so important for chasing your dreams or whatever you want to do in life. Mm. If you're not, then you become lost. It's called spelling for a reason. You're writing spells into the universe. Mm. So people need to be careful what they're putting out there. And if you're full of drinking drugs, you're putting out the negative thoughts, you're putting out the negative vibes. And again, you're just going to keep attracting that. Mm. When did you get labelled with being a psychopath? Yeah, true, yeah. <laughs> so after I came out of jail, I started to commit like violent offences. Um, did you want to be... Could you have potentially done murders just to fit in with those guys who were doing them with that mindset? Um, I don't think because that wasn't it. Wasn't like I I want to go and cr commit a bigger crime all on its own. That was in the back of my mind. It was it was like if I go back in, so what? Yeah, it'd be cool to go back in for a bigger one because my limit my my belief system was warped. Because when you spend time with thousands of people and the first thing they say to you is what you're in for, it doesn't take long before that is you. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so that was in the back of my mind, but not something I was consciously aware of. That with the addiction to violence and also this significance that I was getting through this sort of reputation and also winning a fight made me feel great. Um, and also the drink and drug abuse escalating to the point where I was blacking out and losing control of myself. And I had all this deep rooted trauma. And as they say, like a, a drunk man's actions or a sober man's feelings or whatever the expression is. But I think... I was always an angry, violent person inside due to things that had happened to me or however you'd want to phrase it. And when I was under the influence of drink and drugs, that, that was my outlet to just let it out, to, to unleash it. And it's difficult to unleash it um, in a constructive ways when you don't know what they are when you're younger. And I would either take it out on myself or I'd take it out on other people. And it wasn't always um, other people, it was sometimes myself. You know, I'll, I'll talk in a minute about a time where I tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. But I've actually tried to commit suicide many times in, in sort of abstract ways, ways that I should have died, but I didn't. Uh, there's only one time where I actually attempted to do it, but there's other times where it was, you know, hit or miss whether or not that would have happened or not. Scream out for help. Yeah, but just more of a reckless kind of, I don't give a shit. Like I was self-sabotage. I don't care about myself. I just didn't love myself, didn't care about myself. Therefore, you know, if you don't care about someone, then you don't care if they die. Yeah. And that was the way I felt about myself. Um, but the psychopath thing, so I managed to, managed, so I hit, hit someone with a bottle and I gave them a, uh, brain hemorrhage and luckily I didn't get remanded. I, I, I just, um, you know, it's obviously sensitive saying this, but I just, to be honest, I, the only reason I don't think I got remanded is I always used to put a suit on, slick my hair and I looked like a white guy from the village because I was from Kings Langley outside Watford so I can you know I can look the part um and that always used to work in my favor I think because at one point I had five GBHs um as as, diff as uh, different offenses and there's people that would have gone on remand for one of those so I don't know how I did it um but I went for a pre-sentence report to see what I was going to get sentenced for and I went to probation and she said she actually wrote in there because I've read it. Lewis is going to kill someone one day. And she recommended me for an IPP. I'm sure you've heard of that since yeah, you've been doing yeah. these podcasts, but indefinite public protection order. <clears throat> it's been abolished since because it's just inhumane. I mean, Charles Bronson's still in there doing a 50 year <laughs> based off of it. But so people are still on license with them. They can't, they're, they're trying to overturn them, people who are out now. Yeah. There's, even though it's, they've been, the, people aren't getting them, but the ones who have got them have still got them. Mm. So they're not took away yet. So I know people are getting put back to prison because they are IPP. Yeah. People aren't getting out still because they're on IPP. Mm. People get four or five years, they're in then doing 18 in 20 years and it's because i guess my my <clears throat> crimes didn't really fit that sentence because they weren't as severe but the, the the potential of my mindset and the way that i was reacting to things and the escalation of my crimes and the, and the how quickly they were escalating because i'd also like the other gbhs i was stamping on people's heads and breaking their jaws and cheekbones and nose and stuff like that so it was like pretty much going over the top and then police tried to arrest me and then i'd fight the police and i just looked insane and i did look like i was about to kill someone and maybe i would have um, so she did the pre-sentence report. She absolutely hated me. Well, well, that's what I thought, but actually, quite rightly, probably just said some negative things because I was a negative guy. She sent me for a psychiatric assessment, and I just thought it was part of the process, but it wasn't. And went to St. Um, actually, where was it? No, I, I did go to St. Albans Albany Lodge. That was when I got section of the mental health act. That's another, that's another story. But anyway, I did a um, psychiatric assessment, Doctor Sadler. 
That's his name. And he wrote this big report and it came back with this antisocial personality disorder. And at the time, obviously, I'd never heard of it. And I Googled it and it said psychopath. And like I mentioned earlier, you can have personality disorders, various different ones. That doesn't necessarily mean you're a psychopath, but it means that you're on this spectrum and some of those people can be labeled a psychopath. You know, psychopaths, even in itself, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's interesting. You know, this is something I really want to break the stigma on because I think there's a lot of, it's a big marginalized part of society, especially in the, the prison system. 80% of the prison system have personality disorders and they inherently think they're bad and evil and they can never change. And that's because they just don't understand that they have a mental condition, but they don't understand the positives. With every sort of negative, there's a positive. Now, they might not be emotionally tuned. They might not have much empathy, but they might be um, not risk adverse and they can take, you know, risks that other people aren't prepared to do. They might be very assertive. They might be decision makers. They might be very strategic. And that's why a lot of people get into crime because they have the ability to put themselves in situations that other people won't. But if they was to understand these superpowers, they could channel them obviously into entrepreneurship and things like that and, 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 and have a place in society. But anyway, um, when you get labeled as a psychopath, of course, there's a stigma to it because everyone thinks a psychopath is a serial killer. All right, but you can be a serial killer if you're a psychopath because you are more prone to violence. You are, um, you let your, your, um, not risk adverse. So doing those sorts of things, you're impulsive. Um, there's, there's various different traits of it. I have to have a little look up it again, but, uh, overall would make a good serial killer, which is why they become one, right? Most people that don't have these conditions couldn't bear the thought of doing things like that, you know? But there are also good psychopaths and there are also hidden psychopaths. You know, there's psychopaths in business leadership. Like there'd probably arguments to say like, I don't know, Elon Musk or, yeah, Michael, you know, all Michael, of these. You look at Michael Jordan, you look at Tiger Woods, Mike, Michael Phelps, their mm. training, their exercise, their sacrifice to be the best. Yeah. It's psychotic behavior. There's a thin yeah, line yeah. between success and psychopath, yeah. I believe. I mean, I a mean, lot it, of successful people are psychopaths. Yeah. Because you, you have can, to be. I mean, you can how tell can with you? their mannerisms and the way they talk, the way mm. they think. Mm. But it take, they've used it in a positive. And like you says, just because you're a psychopath, it doesn't mean you're bad. Yeah. The majority of people end up turning bad because they're not cut off your emotions where apparently you don't feel anything. Mm. Is that one of the factors of being a psychopath? I mean, it's on the sort of spectrum. So you're empaths, which are people that feel so, so much, they actually consume other people's energy and feelings. And that's that's even more debilitating in my mind because you can't even have a conversation with someone without crying. And then it, you carry it for days after. So that's one end of the spectrum. The middle ground is someone that just naturally feels their emotions, expresses them, releases them, moves forward, and it's all brilliant. And they, they have this range, this rainbow color of emotions. Getting towards this sort of psychopath end, you, your emotions become very limited, you know, and they're very numb, and they're very shallow. So you, you're, you're going to feel things, but it's only if something serious happens. So if someone dies, you're going to feel something. You know, if you split up with a relationship, you're going to feel something. But on a day to day basis, general things probably won't phase you much. Like, for example, whether this is a product of the psychopathy or whether it's a product of my environment, someone can tell me a story. It could be as deep and as dark as you could possibly imagine and it just won't really register with me. I mean, it doesn't really affect me. It's not like I don't have empathy for them on a, on a logical level. Like I can sit there and understand and want to help them and understand they're going through a tough time, but it's, a, it's more cognitive. I don't have this pain inside me or this heaviness, this, this feeling of dread and, you know, empathy f uh, you know, from a from a felt sense point of view. And then you've got right at the end of psych psych uh, psychopathy, which are people that feel nothing. And and they also get thrills out of hurting people. Um, and those are the serial killers because they have a drive for, to do that. Now, I'm nowhere near that end. And I would admit that I'm on the spectrum. I don't know where it comes from. Um, nature versus nurture. Um, Jeff Beatty in the documentary says it's probably a combination of the both. You know, you can, um, you could probably have a genetic factor, but if you're brought up in a, in, a, in a loving environment, you learn to move through those traits and you learn to understand it to the point where you can actually nurture those, that small flicker of emotion that you've got. You can, you know, turn it into a, you know, throw, 
throw fuel on the fire and turn it into something much greater. But if you have a shallow set of emotions genetically, and then you then suppress them down even further, of course, you're left with not much. So I would say that I'm on there, and but I've used it to my my advantage because, you know, if if if, if you can't see, then you can hear better. If you can't hear, you can see better. And I think that because I am less emotional, not emotionless, but less emotional, I'm able to strategically see better. So I can see things other people can't see. I can break things up in my mind that other people can't do. I can yeah, map out plans. Um, I can see the I guess see the future sounds a little bit out there, but you know, I can't, I have a vision for the future and I can predict the way that things are gonna go. You know, I, and I see sequential sets of things and I speak to other people and they don't have that. So I don't really know what some of these emotions are that people feel, but I know that I have a way of thinking that I know that other people don't think like. So it's just harnessing the one that's going to help. If someone's at the top end of the spectrum of being a psychopath, can they change that method of thinking of trying to then start to feel or they're just totally gone? I think the people that are <clears throat> right on that end, I don't think so. I think they are born that way. There is actually no cure for personality disorders. You can only learn to... Flip bipolar and... No, those ones you possibly, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that one's a little bit more complicated because it's different, that one. Mm -hmm. But personality disorder specifically, there's like borderline personality disorder, emotionally unstable personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, dissocial personality disorder. They're all labels and they're all just some guy that or woman that's gone, this set of symptoms roughly means this, but we're all unique, you know, yeah. so it's difficult to really say. But the the, the people that are out and out psycho, psych, psychopaths um, that feel nothing at all and get a thrill for hurting people, are they curable? I'd like to think they are, but um, personally, I think they're a bit too far gone, yeah. Yeah, there's something totally disconnected from yeah, that, like your some, Jeffrey Darnmos or your King. There's of, something in their brain that's not there. But just because you kill someone, it doesn't mean you're a psychopath. Like, I've no, had no. women on this show who their kids have been abused and they've around with a knife and oh, yeah. murdered them. That's for me, they're yeah. a hero. Like, of course. That's my way, method of thinking, but then people might call me a psychopath or mm. agreeing with murder, but there's different levels of life, how you think, how you feel, and everybody... The, every one of my guests would be labelled a fucking psychopath if, course, they, if yeah. they were to go through a test but majority, the majority of my guests I like and love I speak to on yeah, a daily yeah. and always keep them in touch well, you can be a good psychopath and you can be a lovely guy like there's there's people that are in the military for example that go out there and fight for the country and our freedom and you know they, they might have to kill a few people in the process and, and then you know shut off and get back to work the next day and that is their psychopathy or it is their personality that's allowing them to be able to disconnect and see the bigger mm -hmm. picture and there's also politicians that have been able to drive us you know to win in wars by being able to look at you know should we you know drop a bomb here and kill 200,000 people if we drop a bomb here and kill 300,000 people well this this one makes more sense <laughs> you know not oh my god but what about the other 100,000 you know so they have a place in society that doesn't mean they're necessarily bad and yeah also people do things not because they have no emotions um, but because of circumstances so like you said I mean if someone's hurt your child uh, you're not doing it because you know that you can get away with it without feeling any guilt or remorse or shame you're doing it because you want to do it and you need you feel like you need to do it to protect somebody and it, and they probably have a lot of trauma and guilt and things they have to work through um, to be able to process what they've done whereas a psychopath for example could probably do that and not care that's the difference they could go and kill somebody because it's the right thing to do and be a good psychopath but then actually not care about it after what were you doing for money back then selling drugs were you a drug dealer yeah what just bits of gear weed um methadrone actually meow 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 i don't know if you remember that yeah, I can't. the plant can't, fertilizer yeah, yeah, yeah. it smells like piss oh yeah good shit what speed what was, what was that speed meow, meow. no it was it was a plant fertilizer so it was a legal high at first yeah, uh -huh. I, I know someone that used to get it shipped on yeah, the black shipped. market and like fucking fish tanks. I, I used to get it from Scotland, actually. Yeah. I think had a bit of a market. I might know the guy then. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, what? I think he paid like 100 quid, 200 quid then, but we were selling it for like two or three grand. It was oh, mega mate. money. Yeah, well, because it was legal when I was selling it. I, used to, I made leaflets. I used to give them out around the pubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it went legal and everyone shit himself. But, you know, someone like myself... Whether it's the condition or whether it's just me. MCAT, wasn't it? MCAT, yeah. Yeah, meow, meow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. like, what a weight. Yeah. It was like shards yeah. of glass. Shards of glass. It fucking hurt your nose. But it, it was it was stronger than Coke. It was cheaper than Coke. And you didn't have really a come down for two or three days. So like with Coke, when the birds come out, you're like, oh my God, my yeah. life's shit. But with that, you're like, hey, shops are open. It's going to get another bottle of vodka. Mm -hmm. So it was just an, a next level drug. But um, 
Yeah, and then I moved into selling coke after that as well. And I had a line and then I had a few people working for me. I was no big time gang, so I don't want people to think I was, but on a small scale, you know, I had people working for me. I sold drugs, I f you know, I was violent. You know, I was in that scene. Um, but there were, white, you know, a billion and one people above me in the pecking order. Were you telling people you were a psychopath? No, I didn't even, do you know what? When I got that diagnosis, I just brushed it off because I thought, oh, look, Mr. Goody Two Shoes thinks that I've had a couple of fights because I've been out on the piss and he thinks I'm a psycho. So I didn't think anything of it. It was only later on in life where actually I turned my life around. And the symptomatic behavior was no longer there, but yet some of the traits that were in this diagnosis was still apparent. So I thought, hmm, actually it's interesting because I do feel different and I do feel these things. And, and I started to notice a difference between me and most people. That was something that was obvious. It's like I just I just didn't quite get a lot of other people. I was confused at how they reacted to things. And that got me thinking that I am different, you know. And I know, I know that a lot of people feel like they are different. Um, but specifically in certain aspects, especially emotions, I just kind of got a lot very confused. And then that made me look back at the diagnosis and go, actually, it make, I, I tick every fucking box on there. <laughs> when did you go to rehab? So I was at a mental institute. What was it? What was it you done? So, was so it both? I was 18. I got pissed up on Jack Daniels. Um, this is when I was starting to get a bit aggressive, but not violent, um, drunk. And then, oh, you fucking know that. and then I was having an argument with a girlfriend at the time. And when I first got this girlfriend, I was actually, I was 17 and she filled that void that I felt because I, my family had written me off at this point. They said, you know, you're not part of the family anymore because you're affecting your younger brother. And I even had him selling drugs for me and he was 15 years old. And they said, you got to, you know, we don't want anything to do with you anymore. So I felt, I didn't feel rejected at the time because again, I didn't understand feelings or anything. So I just felt, I guess, something. And then had a, you know, Dr. John D. Martini, I don't know if you've had him on your podcast or you heard of him, but he, he talks a lot about voids create values. So if you don't have something, it will create a desire for it. And I think because I was rejected, you know, it created this even more amplified need for significance and love. And because I wanted significance and love, it would also make me feel rejected and, you know, all sorts of other things. But anyway, I got this girlfriend and not only did she show me love, but she invited me around to her family's house. We would sit in front of the TV, we'd have dinners. And I was like, oh my God, this is what a family's like. Um, and I was with her for about a year and I felt obsessively head over heels in love with her like it was a bit a bit over the top thinking back in it now i wouldn't leave her alone she probably got sick of me by the end um and we got drunk well i know i got drunk mm -hmm. and then one night uh we're having an argument and she said well you know what i cheated on you and i've had a lot of traumas in my life and i, I can list off a few more after this but that one was i would say probably the, the, the strongest trauma i've ever had which is weird isn't it because it's is the one that probably most people can relate to and 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 seemingly the the least significant like everyone oh young heartbreak whatever everyone goes through that but fuck me does that hurt you know especially when you know when it's tied to all these other things because when she said that it hit me hard i felt loss that's what i felt was loss overall because i knew she was gone you know the moment she says that it's like you can't work anymore so i felt loss i felt the rejection not from just her but also kind of triggered the loss, the rejection that my mum and dad and you know, family had, had, had put me you know, through, felt it at the same time kind of thing. Like it was reinforcing these things that I'd cho chosen not to bring my attention to, but it was so overwhelming that I had to see it. And um, I just felt like I'd lost everything. And it confirmed you are this bad and lovable kid, you know, because I had prison, probation, school, I was expelled from school, a psychiatrists, mum and dad. Everyone said I'm bad, so I'm bad. So I went blacked out, went fucking berserk, started smashing her kitchen up around her mum's house, pulled out a drawer, drawer hit the flo floor, and a six inch kitchen knife just fell down uh, out of the drawer. And I didn't even think of it. Again, it was another one of those impulses, like with the guy that I punched. And um, I just went like, <laughs> Didn't even think about it. It was in naught point five seconds, and like just about better, better to see the scars there yeah. and, and there. And I slit my throat, and it started spurting my blood. And then I went downstairs, and he's like, "What have you done, Lewis?" And I like, passed out. Ambulance come. I started fighting the paramedics, <laughs> and then they eventually um, arrested me, stitched me up at the hospital. And I was going, "Leave me! I want to die!" Because I was just did want to die. Leave me! I want to die! Don't touch me! Fuck off! 
they did stitch me up. Then I ran back up to her house. It was all crazy scenario. And I got a section of the Mental Health Act. They put me in St. Albans Albany Lodge. That was what I was thinking about earlier. And um, put me in a padded room. <laughs> blood everywhere you can just imagine <laughs> like literally you can imagine just looking through the I'm window I'm laughing mate because it's uh, <laughs> it's fucking mad as well isn't it but this is this is what love does yeah, love, yeah. love is painful oh. love is not what's going to find and feed your missing pieces or your, whatever is missing in your life it's a everybody wants to feel love yeah it's the most purest form of anything on this planet is love and if you've got love you're winning and it's a uh, but love is painful because it's not a 24 seven thing. Same as happiness or positivity. It's not 24 seven. It's something you need to work at. Mm. And being that kid who's abused and lost and never felt love and having that companion and somebody who cares for you, or sh it may, may be fake love, but you don't care. You're willing to just take it because yeah. it's such a good feeling. It makes you feel warm. Yeah, yeah. makes you feel precious. You would fucking kill for the bitch. Yeah. That's the way it is. You would die for them. You basically try to kill yourself <laughs> yeah, for them. Kill yourself for men are, I believe men are the most vulnerable when it comes to relationships. We don't talk about it and it hits us the most. That's when you see relationship break up. You see the men partying away at the ocean beach, full of yeah. drinking drugs. For the first two yeah. weeks anyway. And she thinks, oh, he doesn't care about me. He's doing that because he's broken. He's yeah, doing that yeah. because he misses you. He's doing that because he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. So they self-medicate. Women kind of just go and have their discussions and they heal quicker. Men don't. There's relationships you think about in the past. You go, fucking I loved her. But yet you destroyed it with your antics or whatever. But relationships are painful love is painful brother like, so you're then fucking trying to top yourself you've slit your wrist your missus is cheating <laughs> you're already a nutcase you've been expelled abused fucking mm -hmm. battered your whole life what happens then when you're sitting in the white padded cell well it's pretty was crazy break? <laughs> well, it's pretty crazy because i was just off my head and i just always used to kick off like even in the police cells i would uh i would just bang on the door for hours and hours on end i just wanted to cause trouble i would sometimes i knew the cameras in there and i would just run run into the wall head first and then pretend to be knocked out with my like, tongue hanging out my mouth just so they'd come in and then when they come in i'd you know charles bronson it up and try and fight i wouldn't fucking put vaseline over me or whatever but i just you just stop kicking off i don't know just give me something like that you know when i was younger i used to smash bust up windows constantly just looking to get arrested so i used to i used to just enjoy it i think in a weird way or enjoy the attention or need something and hope that that might have been the the thing that gave it to me or maybe the, the time that my mum and dad sat me down and said lewis why are you doing this <laughs> it never came um anyway after that the fucking crazy thing was because i was 17 and you know i was this like pretty boy white guy with fucking blonde highlights at the time um they woke up and they I woke up and they just said... The blonde highlights does shout out psychopath to me. <laughs> there, don't I? Well, back 15 That's years a telltale ago, sign, mate. 15 years ago, that was the thing, mate. If you didn't have blonde I used highlights. to have the fucking Gareth Gates spikes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I just love setting fires back in the day. That was my thing. I set everything on fire. Yeah, I bet Everything. I even burnt them on fucking dad's house down. Nearly set my oh, dad's right. car on fire. Oh, right. Just loved that. I loved the smell. I loved being around that. The destructive... Yeah, I get that. There's a, a, there's a, a saying for it. There's a label for that. The setting right. of fires. Um, Paramaniac. I don't know, man, but it's it's not normal. Yeah. I just fucking love it. Well, that. I used to love the sound of shattered glass. Like, I used to smash massive windows, um, but also just small bus stop windows. Don't know why. Just love, love, love the... When you smash a window. Do you feel that was a reflection of your life shattered? Maybe. I didn't think of it like that. Maybe it was. But yeah, I came out of the... Um, so they said, are you all right now? I said, yeah, I'm all right now. They said, all right, you got a contact number so someone could pick you up. And then they just, my mum and picked me up. How long were you in for? I was in there for night. Just one night? Didn't say anything about mental health condition. They just oh. chalked it up to a uh, young breakup, had too much to drink. And uh, my mum picked me up and then she took me in the car, 15 minute drive or whatever. I didn't say a fucking word. And at this time, these these were literally bulbous because they'd stitched up with with wire. And you know, when you stitch something, you've obviously got to like push it together like that. So mine, I look like fucking Frankenstein, mm -hmm. right? And a claret all over me. Obviously, seriously in a bad place, and not the mental health professionals. Not my mum said a, a word, and I got home. My dad didn't say a word. So it was just like just Lewis has done something fucking loopy again. How far were you away from your artery? From my from your artery. Your name, uh, very close. They said, I, I said I clipped it, <clears throat> clipped it. That's why it was spurting. Yeah, I was nearly died. Yeah. When did you start looking at your life and realizing that you were there was something amiss that you weren't right in the head? Um, was there a moment for you? I kind of always knew I was a bit loopy, but I kind of thought I was in control or choosing to do that. Self sabotage, kind of live fast, die young, kind of mentality. I always felt different. Um, 
I had this one voice that told me I was special and there's something, you know, big for me out there. But then that felt quite overwhelming. And then I also had this voice that told me I was bad and unlovable that obviously came from my dad, but I didn't really understand this. So I had this like conflict in my brain, overwhelming. Um, but uh, there's something about extremes that I've always liked. So the, the idea of normalcy uh, scares me. I, I, I hate that. Like I've been in sweat boxes in, the, in the, you know, the, pre, the police wagon taking you to jail, sitting there handcuffed, going to jail, looking through the window, feeling sorry for people walking to work. <laughs> like, I'm fucking glad I'm not you. Like thinking that I'm in a better position. I would rather be in jail than do that. A lot of denial, do you think? Is that a bit, I don't know, because I still feel a bit like that now. Uh, I've always said that if I got to like 50 and I still didn't make it, I'd just fucking, I don't know, just smuggle drugs across the border or something. I don't know. <laughs> what is making it to you? So everybody defines success yeah. and money differently. I'm still figuring it out, to be honest. Because every time I climb that ladder, I realize that I've propped it up against the wrong wall. Or um, or I need another rung on the on the on the ladder. I th if I get here, I'll be happy. If it's I get not, it's here, it's never ending. Oh, it the matter. money's never no, ending. No. The fame, and or it the doesn't tension. bring the happiness even. That's bullshit, man. It's fake. It's yeah. like trying to enjoy the journey, which is difficult, especially when you try to be successful, because it's always leveling up, raising yeah. the bar, more pressure, more sacrifice. Mm. You just try to stay sane in an insane world. <laughs> yeah. This is a mental institute. The whole earth is a mental institute. Yeah. The killings, the bombings, the drink, the drugs, the violence. It's not normal. No. It's not normal. Some people think this is hell and they've got a fucking right yeah, reason yeah. to believe it, but there is a lot of pure stuff on this planet. Newborn babies, the love, the joy, f the, where they can go in life and this, the nature. There's a lot of beautiful stuff on this planet we don't touch on enough, but mm. that is what it is, man. If people can find their passion and find their true purpose, purpose they can do anything in their life. And there's people let, with less than me and you who are happier. Oh, hundred percent. You think, oh, man, you kind of get envious of them when you've got nothing. You're envious yeah. of the people with something. Then you start <laughs> yeah. making something. You're envious of not having anything because you've not really. You're quite content, not not having to chase anything. And people mm. working ninety fives, I used to think fucking mugs. But yeah, now that you become self-employed and working for yourself you, you work more hours yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah dana white says that you're working christmas day new year's eve you new year's day your laptop yeah, at yeah. five and then that's it yeah, fuck off man they've yeah. got the right idea <laughs> it's some psychotic <laughs> bastards who are fucked up man well, it's only recently that I, me and my business partner we've been like grinding on the business 14 hours a day seven days a week you know just doing what we need to do and um we came up with this revolutionary idea and it was like why don't we work monday to friday it takes saturday and sunday off to refresh and then come back on monday and we was like that's a fucking great idea and then we're like oh, hang on a minute that's what everyone does <laughs> that's just a normal nine to five but yeah that that balance is hard to do when you've got those responsibilities but yeah. but yeah um yeah maybe people have got it right i mean i was watching come dine with me recently for the first time in a long time i don't really watch tv but i just fancied a bit of sort of you know typical yeah. i was watching and i thought all of them are happier than me <laughs> not that i'm like miserable but like I've got this such this this compelling drive that where and and you would have heard this story over and over again, so I won't go into it too much detail. But voids create values, as we, as I mentioned. So there's this internal drive to to prove my dad wrong, to show him that I can amount to something, and that I am significant and loved. And my dad's died since, so I'll never be able to fulfil that circle and that loop. Um, so I'm replaying that program. And although I'm cognitively be aware of it, it doesn't stop it from replaying. And I'm working on it, and I'm breaking it down, and I'm bringing more awareness to it. And I'm, you know, each each day, each month, each year, I'm you know becoming better and becoming more aware of things that do make me happy, and you know, moving away from the things that are just superficial. Um, but I can't even remember what the point was now. Um, overall, yeah, I I have got a lot of uh, space for happiness, and I don't know if that comes from the personality disorder as well because emotions you know happiness joy happiness fulfillment there they are shallow for me sometimes I, I do feel quite flat you know flat is quite a, a common feeling for me and, and i think it is for a lot of addicts as well i think that's why we we feel the need to to use drink drugs or anything like gambling sex anything to give us that edge to make us feel a bit better you know trying to use an external problem to fix a, an internal solution you know i know you've got a lot of experience with that yourself mm -hmm. um but I do feel flat sometimes. Um, and I don't know whether that's just part of my genetic makeup. I don't know if that's something uh, that w will change through time. Um, but I think a lot of people can relate to that as well. Yeah. Did you ever have that conversation with your dad? No, no. So so he when, when I was 21, um, he got pancreatic cancer from the drinking. He was, he was an alcoholic. He would drink like a bottle of vodka and like 
bottle of wine and two beers every single night, every night for as long as I knew him. Um, and uh, yeah, one day I walked in and found him. Well, we he he was sick loads of blood, and then we um, went to the hospital to visit him. And they said, "Oh yeah, he's on this room over there. I was going to go visit him." Walked into the room. The nurse forgot to tell me he died. So I just walked in and just see him dead. He literally yellow mouth open. It's like what the fuck. Yeah, and he died and he, and he withered away into this frail, tiny old man. He must have aged about 40 years in six months. Like he went from like dark hair, tall, fat, to literally arms like that, complete white hair, 80, 90 year old looking man when he was 53 um, in six months. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, he died. So we never had a chance to have that conversation. But interestingly, um, <clears throat> I've, done, I've done some conscious connected breath work. I don't know if you've heard of, of that. Yeah, I've heard of it's a specific breath work. It's not like Wim Hof, but it's where you have this circular rhythm of breath work. And they say that um, it releases trauma. It can release trauma as well. Yeah. Um, I've done you can that. Also, yeah. I've done that for a few weeks. Sorry to interrupt, but, but I was getting angry. Me and my friend Jed Neil Glasgow, mad bastard back in the day, changed his life. And we were doing a lot of the breath work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But we were getting fucking angry mm. after it. We're going in the cars, and yeah. I'm quite content now. And I don't, I'm not an angry. But maybe that needed to come out. But we stopped. I had to stop because <clears throat> I'd felt it was like a something coming to a head. But I felt as if it was bottled up. He carried on with it, and it feels good for it now. But I, I was getting more angry on some occasions after doing it. Mm. But it was like a release. It's obviously a blockage. But the, the breath techniques and breathing exercises are unbelievable. Yeah. That's like a rhythm in it. It's like where well, you're breathing. Well, there's a few things to it. They say that emotion is stored in the body. So you, we usually have this emotional loop where something happens, you feel the emotion, you understand it, express it fully by crying, by venting, by shouting, whatever it might be. And then you then process it and then you let it go. And then that's it. It's complete. That, that emotional loop's complete. But if you don't, like we, like men do and society tells us to be strong and, you know, whatever, you know, you experience an emotion, you don't, you don't uh, release it or express it in any way. And then it stores itself in the body energetically. It's a little bit woo-woo on the spectrum, but um, there is some truth to it because I've experienced it. Um, but there's also conscious connected breathing where it just uh, you access a, uh, an altered state. So just like if you hyperventilate or whatever, you're going to get a bit dizzy or whatever, or you do like a fucking nos balloon or whatever. Um, when you breathe so deeply in this conscious connected way where your inhale meets your exhale, you start to create this rhythm and sooner or later, you just zone out and you drop into some weird fucking space. And, you know, unless you've done it, you you, you obviously won't be able to, I mean, you've done it, but unless people, you know, listening have, have experienced it, you won't be able to get your head around it. But I've, because <clears throat> the, the, the brain doesn't really know much, uh, they don't really understand the difference so much between imagination and memory and dreams and memory. You know? These are all just, you know, creations of our brain, but they're very similar. And in these altered states of consciousness, I've gone in and I've had conversations with my dad, like if, 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 although he's dead. Um, I, I've even had a conversation with him when he was my age. So one of these like times that I was, bang, I was like passed out. He completely passed out. He started getting, I can't remember what it's called. Tangles. Your hands are all, yeah. yeah, it's like a spasm. Yeah, and you're just all fucking <laughs> mad. <laughs> and, um, People and, would think that's a him in the fucking white cell again, but you do. With those sort of breathing techniques, the tingles, the pain, the people screaming, the crying. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of emotion comes to the surface. So you yeah. then seeing your dad, what happened? So I had a, a conversation with my dad when he was my age. So it was me and him, 30 to 30 years old. Just And I was just like, wow, he's a nice geezer. And I just sort of came to this realization that he'd just been through trauma and we had a conversation. And I, I wasn't, co you know, I wasn't aware enough to be able to say everything that I wanted to say because obviously I was in this dream state. So it's not like I was like, oh, brilliant, dad, I've got you here. I've got these questions that I wanted you to answer. But it was able, I was able to, have a little bit of an experience of having a conversation with my dad, which you, obviously is something you would never be able to do when someone's died. But I also had this really powerful experience once, which actually showed me the root of all of my trauma. So I was having this conscious connected breath work again, passed out into the state, it takes like 20, 30 minutes to get into this place. And I do it in Bali and I have all, the, all these other fucking shit going on around me and stuff. I go full in with it. It's not just me going, <laughs> you know, I've got people massaging my feet and fucking banging drums and shit, <laughs> getting right in it because I like to be immersive. And um, I saw this little kid and uh, I was like, who's that? 
And then I got close and I realized it was me. It was a young version of me, about seven years old. And I could tell something was a matter because he was this up, upset little kid. And people watching this are going to think, this guy is fucking off his head. But if you try it, then you'll know it. It's one of those things. And I said, what's the matter? He wouldn't tell me. And I kept on trying to take his face like that to, to look at me, like, tell me what's the matter. And he would look away, you know, like typical. And I said, what's the matter? And I knew that this kid, me, had the answer to something that I was burying. I said, what's the matter? And then it just zoomed out and it took me into my nan and granddad's um, house on my granddad's retirement birthday, which I'd completely forgotten, but it all came back like vividly. And it was a time where my two uncles beat my dad up and I was there and I was jumping on top of my uncles and I was pulling their hair out and I was going, get off my dad, get off my dad. And I just, I remember feeling powerless like I couldn't protect my dad. Um, and I just erupted into this fucking tsunami of emotion from this breathwork session. And then he like put me in the feet, fetal position and I kind of just it poured out and I woke up and I was just like, what the fuck's happened? And the just fucking bed was just drenched. And I'd been crying for about 15 minutes. And then I realized that that kind of where, it, I think that's where everything stemmed from. I felt like I couldn't protect my dad. I felt powerless. And I felt guilty, um, like it was my fault, I couldn't do anything. And then once you have something like that going on, and then these other things get piled on top, like your dad hitting you after and telling you you're a buffoon after, you don't go, oh, it's because this happened. You just collect all these experiences and you make a view of who you are and how you sit in the world. And for me, I drew the conclusion, obviously, that I was bad and that was uh, not a good conclusion to draw. Did you forgive your dad? <clears throat> um. Yeah, I have, yeah. Because you understand the beatings and the, the, the abuse and the addiction that he had, that's a lost soul as well. Yeah, yeah, he had his issues, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's more difficult to, to do the forgiving piece when you've never actually had that conversation. Part of me still thinks that if he if he saw me, he'd, he would still have something to say. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, look at Lewis, fucking scammer. <laughs> so, you know, Buffoon. Yeah, put me down again. Because I remember I got a job once and I, was, um, I got a job as like an IT salesman little bit telly sales ish but a bit more premium than that and uh came home told him about it and he's like oh you're one of those annoying blokes that bring me up at work so he's always got to fucking say something and your dad and he would call my brother the intelligent one and he'd say to me why, why can't you be funny like your brother always had something to say so part of me thinks he would still do that i'd love for him not to do that i'd love for him to be able to say you know I'm proud of you and all that sort of thing but i never get that so i've got, kind of got to give that myself um but i definitely forgive him for what he did because i don't think he knew any better as well i think he had that from his dad as sort of generational trauma do you see a lot of yourself and your dad unfortunately yeah uh, i mean specifically before do you think he's seen a lot of himself in you possibly never really thought of that but yeah maybe mm -hmm. makes sense I'm, I'm very like him now even like him now really uh very different as well at the same time yeah of course <laughs> but you can recognize certain bits when did you start making the changes in your life to then not be that fucking drink drug fueled yeah. full of hate and anger yeah, so the violence just got worse to the point where I was addicted to fighting, where I would just go in, fight a couple of times a night. Like sometimes I'd go into nightclubs, fight, get my shirt ripped off, go and give a homeless guy a five, I'd get his t-shirt, put it on, and then go to the back of the queue and get back in, have another fight. It's just stupid. Um, and then I worked abroad in Ayanapa and Magaluf, and I was getting in trouble with all sorts of people from the, the mafia to nightclub owners, you know, get my jaw broken, my teeth knocked out, slashed in the back with a knife. Everything was just absolute chaos. Drink, drugs became a drug addict and an alcoholic to the point where I had to wake up and drink, and I was doing drugs for four days in a row without eating or sleeping. I know that you've done a lot of gambling, but I was obsessed with gambling as well. I used to sometimes go and watch gamblers with no money just to watch the fucking roulettes when the roulette will spin for fucking 12 hours straight out of seizure in the middle of the bookies once because I hadn't eaten or fucking anything just absolutely gone <laughs> and um there's probably a lot in between that, that I've missed out um of course that that life of chaos every day is a different story I could share with you but I don't really like to get into the kind of um you know the war stories you know oh fucking knock this geezer out you know because I wasn't that guy I never was that guy like I was a fucking ballerina at one point you <laughs> know I was never a big time gangster. I was from a village outside Watford. I just somehow managed to get into, you know, county lines into the sort of drugs and sort of things progressed a little bit. But but anyway, it was quite chaotic. But it got 
to the point where I came back from my traveling abroad, thought I was choosing to do the drugs and the alcohol because it was part of the lifestyle and I was embraced for it. So I was like the craziest one on the island um, in Ayanapa um, because I was just fucking <laughs> swinging from balconies, fighting like with Cypriot mafia, literally. I know that sounds like bullshit, but let's uh, this, this, <laughs> this bring people in to prove it because they would tell me you better stories than I would. I can't remember half of this shit because I blacked out every night. But I'd wake up in the morning and I'd say to my mate, what, what did I do? And he'd say, oh, you fucking punched the fucking mafia. And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> like, yeah, you did. Um, but they kind of had a weird sort of level of respect for me in the end because I was just this crazy nutcase. Anyway, so life went chaotic. Came back from abroad and realized that I was still needing drinks, still needing drugs. Got a job because I could always put a front on, could always put a suit on and look like a very well-respected, you know, working class white guy you know i i didn't have any brute like i've had lots of bruises on my face but you know when they healed didn't have any scars so i could and, and i would never dis disclose my criminal record so i could walk in and get most jobs you know i could blag an interview easily so i got this job as an it sales rep again it was around christmas and two weeks in i had a fight at the christmas party and got sacked mm -hmm. uh, so it was christmas time and um i went out and i was in a taxi queue and I didn't realize there was a long taxi queue and I just jumped straight to the front, tried to get in a taxi and some guy started to grab me. And this is not an excuse. This is just to explain what was going on because to this day, I don't know what the guy looked like because all I can see is my dad's face. I just, I just remember my dad going, you fucking idiot, you buffoon, you know. It triggers you. Yeah, it triggers a real thing. It's no excuse. You can't just say, oh, I stabbed him because he triggered me. You know, I understand that, but it's, you know... It makes sense as to why people do things like that. People don't just always decide, I'm going to go out and commit that crime. There's usually a reason for it. And sometimes it's because, you know, something's happened or sometimes it's because the, the situation's escalated and it's caused you to react in a certain way due to previous experiences or trauma and what have you. Anyway, this guy shouted in my face. He called me something. He reminded me of my dad. I was 25. He was 40. Um, and I punched him and he went straight down head first. Uh, and there was a thud like a, right on the concrete and um, everyone looked around the train station and then I looked over him and I was going to stamp on him to be honest you know it's the sort of horrible fuck I was I'll be honest um, I did not have any morals with fighting I'd stamp on people's heads I just wanted to win that was my only intention and um, I looked over him and I saw, saw this slow dark trickle of blood and I'd only seen that in films when someone had been like shot in the head and I thought he's dead. He is dead. And um, so I literally got my barber jacket off and I put it over his head. I thought he was dead. And I looked, there was a CCTV camera. I was outside a train station in Watford Junction. And I just literally held my hands up and waited for him to arrive. I knew that, I, you know, if I, if I left, then I'm going to get even longer on my sentence. So put me in the back of the car. Didn't tell me if he was dead or not. And to cut a long story short, he was in a coma for three days and he had another brain hemorrhage. But at this point, I had two GBHs on my record, four ABH and a fray, because the other GBHs got dropped down in the end. Um, and two, two of these GBHs both caused brain hemorrhages. So obviously, I went to prison. I should have got a lot longer. Um, they said you would get three years, but I pleaded guilty at the scene. So they gave me half off. I usually get a third off for, for pleading guilty, but I got half. So I got 18 months, which is actually a very low sentence. But again, like... You know, I feel sorry for people that get judged, you know, by the way that they look. But I think just always, if you put a suit on and you slick your hair to the side, I think you get half your sentence. <laughs> Little top tip for you criminals out there, but boys and girls. Um, but I used to always get low sentences. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I think it's because of that, which is fucking not fair at all. Um, and that, that was the moment I changed my life around. And I'd love to tell you it was because I had a lot of guilt or remorse for that guy. But it's very hard to have a guilt or remorse for that guy when, to me, I don't know him. I don't even know what he looks like. He shouted at me in a taxi queue. I would, uh, If I was playing the game right now, I could say to you, oh, I feel so bad about what I did. Um, it's fucking awful that he had to experience that. And, and, and intellectually, I can say that. But do I really feel remorse or guilt for it? Difficult because I didn't experience it at the time. If it happened now, I think I would because I've grown a lot. But because it happened back then when I was just completely shut off, I can't just like go back and change some emotion and remember it. So I said so that wasn't my turning point. You know, the fact that I nearly killed someone wasn't my turning point. It was it was actually the fact that my um, 
and this isn't in the documentary because obviously I couldn't put everything in there, but um, my friend, I rang up my friend and I said, what people are saying about me on social media because I still got a buzz off that. I liked it. Oh, at least I've been sent to prison. I'm thinking, sitting there thinking, oh, well, everyone's going to be talking about this. Pathetic. I know it is, but I'm just being honest. I like to be just raw and, you know, as honest as it can be. And there'll be people going, what a fucking idiot. I'll, the, the comments are going to be going off the fucking. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's always going to happen, isn't it? But um, I just got to be honest. And I think a lot of people can relate to it. I mean, they, they, there is an element of pride that goes into it. Otherwise, why the fuck would you do it? You know, these people want to do those things. Obviously, they wouldn't do it. I don't think many people would admit to it. And I wouldn't want to do it now. And I've got a whole different perspective over the world. But at the time, like I, that fed me and I didn't have anything else. There was no love. There was no significance. There was no self-worth. It was just literally the kind of power and the significance I felt from the reputation that I'd got and the identity of being crazy. And I kind of liked it because it was all the only option I had. It was that or nothing. And fuck knows where nothing would have led me. Probably, you know, trying to commit suicide again. So... They said you're on the front page of the paper, boorish and violent, which I didn't know what it was, but it was a pig, <laughs> which is nice. Um, I didn't care. And then, but they said there's a picture of you that your mate has posted on Facebook. One outside the courtroom the day you were sentenced and one outside the exact same courtroom the day you were sentenced seven years before with the caption above it, nothing changes. And weirdly, that was the thing that kind of triggered it because it was it was my best mate at the time and he was kind of just about worse than me in some respects. Not worse than me in some respects. No, 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 we were equally as bad. I was thinking, how can you fucking say nothing changes? And for him to say that I thought, made me actually think. Because if a goody two-shoes says that, I'm going to be like, well, of course. But, you know, this guy's, you know, a wrong one as well. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, nothing changes. And then he got me thinking, nothing had changed. You know, I you know, I tried to change things around me, but I'd never once looked at myself. And I realized, although it's absolutely obvious, that if I wanted to change my life, I had to change myself. And up until that point, I'd blamed everything and everyone around me for my life was so difficult. And I'd never taken responsibility or looked at myself. And this is really che cheesy and cliche, but it is my story, so I've got to tell it. I went back to my cell and there's a, they didn't have mirrors in there. They just got scratched off piece of metal. And I looked at myself in the scratched off piece of metal. And although it was probably the worst reflection I've ever seen, I got a chance to just look at myself properly for the first time. Like I really looked at myself. And um, yeah, it's just, as cheesy as it sounds, I made a decision that I want to change myself. And luckily, so luckily, I've had this addictive personality. I've been addicted to drink, drugs, sex, gambling, whatever it might be. Whatever gave me something, I would, I would obsessively do it. And I, I latched onto the fact that oh, I'm going to change my life completely. You know, I had ideas of changing my name, moving away, you know, just changing everything. And I got addicted to personal development. Uh, started small uh, in prison. I started to, you know, read, tidy up my cell, go to the gym, sign up for maths and English lessons, um, do rehab programs, do counseling, do AA meetings. And I realized that there was so much support available. You know, I was, I was the guy that was going, fuck everyone. No one wants to help me. They, you know, they just want to keep us locked up. Blah, blah, blah. The moment I opened my eyes and just looked for help, it was there everywhere. And one thing led to the next. And, uh, I started off with maths and English. And, um, that was an interesting sort of thing that I had to go through because obviously I had this fear of being stupid and I'd left school with no GCSEs because I was expelled and I was doing maths and English functional skills one and two which is the equivalent of like a 10 year old and I went in there and I just screwed the paper up and chucked it away and um and uh even though I was one that signed up for it you know, 25 years old I was acting like a kid and then uh, the prison shooter little old lady come and sat down next to me and asked me what was the matter and I just said I just don't understand which is really weird for me to say because I didn't even try and understand it. Didn't read the paper, hadn't looked at the board, didn't even know what the class was about. And then I realized I was just on this autopilot of I'm never going to allow anybody to prove that I'm stupid because it's this deep fear of proving my dad wrong. So I would avoid it at all costs. And that was causing me to be defensive and that was why I was crossing my arms and throwing the paper and stuff like that. And she sat down with me, she helped me do a couple of calculations and I got them right. And... She eventually supported me to, to do my maths and English functional skills. And I could go into this whole journey, but maybe they can watch a documentary to see the whole thing. But I did that. 
I then did this wrapped program, which is rehabilitation of addicted prisoners trust. And that was the first time I got a chance to, to learn something about emotions because they used to give us pieces of paper. Well, before they gave us pieces of paper, they would ask us how we felt and we'd go around in a circle and just, we'd all just say, I'm all right, or I'm angry or I'm hungry. <laughs> that was all that we would say because no one had any other range of emotion, whether it was these personality disorders or the fact that they'd never, never learned to nurture them. Their only outlet is usually anger. Um, which is why they get themselves into a lot of these situations. But then they give us these paper, bits of paper and it would have different types of emotions on there. And people would say, well, I guess actually today I'm feeling a bit frustrated or I'm feeling a bit sad. You know, and we'd start to actually connect, you know, what we're feeling to what that could actually be called and start to build up our emotional intelligence. You know, I was emotionally unintelligent. <laughs> um, and yeah, I started learning bits of personal development, very basic stuff. And I thought, fuck, this works. This is good. Like this is helping. So I got a flavor for it. And then they offered me an opportunity to do rehab. It was a six month rehab. They'd pick me up from the prison gates, take me straight to rehab. And I did exactly that. And I thought that was going to be a lovely experience. And it turned out to be worse than prison. Why? Because in prison, you can, you know, 23 hours a day a lot of the time, depending on what prison you're in, but definitely for a large part of the day, you're locked behind your door in this safe, you know, safe environment, technically, once it's locked, and you're just blissfully in this place where you can just be ignorant to anything. There's no past because it's got done. There's no future because, you know, it's been taken away and you're just in the present. You know, I say that prison is the most relaxed, some of the most relaxing periods of my life. You know, I, I like parts of prison. Sometimes I miss parts of prison because there's nowhere, nowhere, to, nowhere to be, no one, no one to be, nothing to do, nothing to decide, no responsibilities, no bills to pay, nothing to even think about. You just get your door unlocked, you go in here. Okay, that's it. So there's something so peaceful, especially when they lock that door at night and you're like, I just took the TV on. But in rehab, I thought they were going to teach me how to not drink and not take drugs. Didn't even talk about it, rarely talk about it. They spoke about me, why I felt the need to use the drink and drugs, the trauma, my story, the way that I felt, the way that I thought, uh, my limiting beliefs, my perspective of the world. And they got me to really highlight all of the damage that I'd caused to myself and others to the point where it feels so painful that you go, fuck, I need to change that. And it was so painful that there was a guy in our rehab that hung himself off his shoelaces on the stairs and killed himself. Fucking crazy. But I did the work. Didn't want to at first. I was a stubborn kid at first. I was literally like a child. Did the work. Walked out that rehab six months later and my head felt clear. How and was then, it opening up those the wounds? It, it wasn't good. Was... It wasn't good at first. Like at one point, I, I mean, I felt suicidal as well. I mean, it wasn't like I wanted to kill myself, but I remember going back to my little cell pretty much as it was. <laughs> it wasn't far of a cell. And um, it would be so overwhelming that with suicidal thoughts, I don't think it's necessarily always I want to end my life. It's just, this is so painful and this is so painful. What else can I do? You know, I can't go back to my old ways of living life now because you've exposed it. You've ruined it for me because I now know that it's fucking awful. So if I go back to that, I'm going to feel like a scumbag. And this new way of recovery is going to lead me through this whole path of going through all sorts of shit that I don't want to be thinking about. So what, where do I go from here? And yeah, I had suicidal thoughts and it was painful, but I wrote myself a note. And when I was on, you know, on feeling positive, I, I call it the inner coach and the inner critic. You know, there's the, the person that, you know, there's the thought in your head, the voice in your head that wants to cheer you on and wants you to do good things with your life. And there's also the, you know, the thought in your head that wants to sabotage and drag you, drag you down. The problem is a lot of people don't know the differences between those two voices and they act on everything that they hear. You know, they use the analogy and you know, if you can't trust yourself, who can you trust, right? Wrong. <laughs> you know, if I trusted myself, I'll be fucked. I've got to ignore myself most of the time and think, what would someone else do? <laughs> Cause my way doesn't work. Um, but I started to, separate those voices and when i got the the positive voice that's like this is good for you this you're, you're making progress you're in rehab you're clean and sober you're moving in the right direction i'd have to write it down because i knew that it wasn't long before the other voices coming in i'd write it in i put it up on the wall and then it said something like dear lewis you've been here before you're going to be here again keep going this will pass keep going love the real lewis and uh, once I got through that battle, which is what I call it, an internal battle between these two, these two people, these two voices, 
And this is not like some fucking, uh, what would you call it, schizophrenic voice. This is the same internal dialogue we all have. But usually it's just, uh, yeah, one harmonious voice rather than being able to separate the two. But it's important to separate the two so that we can choose where we give our power, where we give our energy and our attention. And when I would win, I see winning the battle, my inner critic would become weaker because it doesn't have the power to influence me anymore. My inner, inner coach would become stronger. And then I'd go to the piece of paper that I put on the wall and I'd sign it to remind myself that I had won this battle before. And then that battle would become less and less. I would not need to read the paper anymore. And after a while, that process was happening automatically in autopilot. And then after a while, the inner critic become so drowned out that it was barely there now of course every now and again it rear its head but i'm so aware of what that voice is and what it says to me that i'm just like oh, okay i know that voice and i know what you're trying to do and you're not going to get me so that's when it started working on yourself all the inner demons all the pain all the misery changing all yourself when you try to change <clears throat> it's not so much the change it's painful it's the conscience that reminds you of the shit that you've done yeah the hearts that you've broke, the people you've fucked over, the lies, the stealing, the cheating, the damage that you've done to yourself internally. That's the hard part for me when I was, the, the, that's the difficult thing when you start, because you block it all out. You're living mm. a life of a, a fucking coward and a, a, I always say it with the great pretenders. We're all actors. This is just a big act. This is just a big stage and everybody's mm. just acting fucking mad. But it's the conscience. How did you deal with that when it... It, it, it reminds you of the shit that you've done mm -hmm. you nearly killed yourself the suicidal thoughts the psychiatric mm -hmm. wards the fucking being diagnosed as a psychopath and then it's just how did do you then was that did that happen in rehab or was it a steady process in terms of how it made me feel about it all yeah when you start remembering the shit yeah that you've done. i mean to be honest i've still got these low shallow kind of flicker of emotions so it, it's not like i was hit with this overwhelming sense of guilt mm -hmm. i must admit um I still in rehab didn't get it. Like I would see people graduate from rehab and I'd see other people around me crying. And I'd be like, what the fuck is the matter with you? Thinking they're the problem. Like stop being a <laughs> fucking drama queen. Like you just barely met the person. Like what are you crying for? But really I was jealous and Envious. insecure about the fact of why can't I, why haven't I got that? Mm -hmm. So, but what I did, the realization I did have is that is the fact that I've been traumatized. You know, I don't necessarily take the label of trauma or a victim or whatever, but when I was sharing, one of the exercises in rehab is to share your story. And I didn't know what it was. Like now I can just reel it off and I can, I know all the segments of the trauma. Before then it was kind of buried in the back of my mind to the, especially like the sexual abuse one. Like I hadn't probably even thought about that in 10 years mm -hmm. or longer, 20 or something. Um, maybe not that long, but yeah, it was, it was only when I actually got told to go away and write my story out and then you share it to the group. And I shared my story thinking, kind of still thinking that everyone was going to be like, look at this young lad coming here, think he's got problems. Because there was like heroin addicts, crack addicts that had come off the street that were like 50 years old that had their kids taken away. I thought their stories were going to be, not that their stories weren't significant, but I thought they were going to look at my story like, fucking hell, is that it? Like, shouldn't really be in here. Mm -hmm. But I shared my story and their, their, their jaws dropped like that. And I thought, fuck, and it hit me then that I was traumatized, that I'd actually had trauma. Because I never, I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. I knew like some shit things had happened and it kind of shaped me, but I didn't realize they were to that extent. And I actually needed to be in rehab and there was a lot of work to do. Um, and there was this one poignant moment where I was still very defensive because that was that was my defense, <laughs> to be defensive. Just fold my arms, uh, I'm not doing this. Tracksuit bottoms, hand down my trousers, you know, you know the guy, still like that at 25 years old. Um, and, uh, I said, I know what you're trying to do to the council. You're just trying to brainwash me because I still didn't like the idea of normality. I did not, did not like that. I, I still don't know. I still haven't quite picked out why I didn't like that. But I think it's because I've got this extreme mindset, black and white thinking. I'm either going to be a fucking career criminal or I'm going to be a fucking god. <laughs> Should have said that. That'll be the fucking papers tomorrow. But um, <clears throat> I've got this black and white thinking. I think it actually might come from the personality disorder. Actually, I think it's one of the symptoms. Um, all or nothing. Um, <clears throat> but I said, you're just trying to brainwash me. Um, you just want me to be like you and I don't want to be like you. And I know better. I didn't probably say that exact words, but I was thinking that and I said something along those lines. And she said, Lewis, your best thinking, your absolute best thinking has put you into prison and now into rehab. Maybe your brain needs a good wash. And that was a real, that was the realization that I kind of needed 
to sort of hit my ego a little bit and realize that my way wasn't working and that you know i had you know I, I i married that up with the fact that i had these two, two voices and realized she was the one in favor of this empowering inner coach that's going to drive me forward and if i keep on listening to myself and this inner critic then i'm just going to revert back to my old ways like i kept on doing over and over again you know make two steps forward and 10 steps back wondering where everything went wrong. Things spiraled out of control all the time. And so I decided I needed to try somebody else's way. So I did all of their stuff and I hated it all, mm -hmm. but it fucking worked. <laughs> so how long ago was this? Eight years ago. Did you start the life coaching stuff then? Because back in the day, I used to listen to Les Brown, Tony Robbins, yeah. get an understanding of it, of life and changes. But when did the life coach stuff start? When did you yeah. start this multi-million pound business? <clears throat> so, I started off, um, I finished rehab, that was six months. Then I did AA and NA meetings, did 90 meetings in 90 days. And there was a guy that came up to me one day and he said, um, can you help me? And I was like, what the fuck are you asking me for? I'm an addict as well. I can't, <laughs> fucking no use to you, mate. You don't want to learn anything from me. He said, oh no, but this is my first day. Um, so I said, all right, there's, you know, you can get a cup of tea over there and, you know, you can, there's leaflets over there and there's fag break halfway through. And then it made me realize actually I can help people, even though I'm not, you know, exactly where I need to be, I'm, you know, I'm one step ahead. And that kind of gave me a little realization and I felt kind of good for helping that person for the first time. I've never helped anyone before. And I think that was where of anyway. And then, um, part of my... I was on employment support allowance, like benefits, and I can't remember what it was a part of, whether it was probation, I think it was probation, but I had to do voluntary work as a part of it. And I did some voluntary work and I started enjoying that as well. And I just got a bit of a, I just got immersed into this world of personal development and I was seeing the changes in my life. And I moved away from all my friends and family and lived in Portsmouth where this rehab was. And I was blown away that I changed my life. You know, I never thought I was going to change. You know, I wasn't the one that was going to change. Some people might have changed, but not me, but I did. <clears throat> so I was compelled to share it. So I started just sharing it with pretty much everyone I spoke to. And I used to always look for people online that look miserable and say, hey, do you want to go for a coffee? And we'd meet up at Costa Coffee and I'd sit there and have a coffee with them. I'd even buy the coffee and then sit down there and just help them for free and fucking blow their minds. And then I realized that everything in rehab, everything in um, the AA meetings, everything that I'd ever experienced that not only I'd got through myself, but I'd listened to in other people's stories and their relapses and breakthroughs and their denials and beliefs and you know, triggers and traumas. I'd absorbed it all and I'd created the, you know, the world's best life coaching training, in my opinion. And I went away and did some qualifications and things like that and started to charge for it. And this was, bef this was seven years seven years ago I was actually only about seven years seven months out of jail when I became a life coach which is fucking mad when you think about it but take action guys you know don't wait you yeah, know there's people in prison who come life coaches yeah <clears throat> yeah wow That's people so... and like, anybody can change I always fucking say it and I'll keep saying it for people to register in their mind no matter your background no matter who you are what you are you can make better changes to make better decisions in your life to be a better individual 100% does it make you does it mean you're immune to all pain and traumas you're you're going to be living to the day you die with all that pain and trauma. It's just you don't feed it anymore. Mm. I think about drinking drugs and gambling all the all the fucking time. Mm. I just don't act on it. it. Doesn't have the power the way it used to when I was weak, when I was soft, when I was fragile, when I thought that was the right idea. There comes a stage of your life you go enough's enough. Mm. I don't want to be this fucking idiot anymore. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So you started the life coaching business, and so it was free at first. Um, free, just helping free, people. Yeah. Um, feeling good about it because when yeah. I was going again through my changes I, I was preaching all the time I ended up becoming a fucking PT and I felt it was if I was preaching because mm -hmm. I made these changes and I wanted to share it with everybody yeah but you know yourself when you're on that journey back in the day if you were in the fucking mental institute and high on gear somebody says to you look I can change you'd have told me fuck off you'd think he was crazy yeah so yeah. I seen that at the start was preaching a lot did you were you doing that sort of thing I tried to hit it from a different <clears> point of view where I didn't tell people what to do and I just shared what I went mm -hmm. through so i took it from an uh, i point of view rather than you point of view people don't like to be told what to do you yeah. know but they See, just, i was telling everybody don't yeah, drink yeah. fucking i think it's the pink don't clip. drink yes. it's fucking mugs game i was reading out about <laughs> alcohol and people were saying he's just a fucking pest some people might but some people would have got a lot from it but yeah. i think it's much better for people to come to their own realizations and their own epiphanies and learn from your story you know they hear, you hear your experience and they go 
maybe I should give up drinking. You know, mm -hmm. that's way more empowering because it's something that they've decided to do and a choice that they've made for themselves. Someone tells you to do that. I, rem I remember my dad came into my room once when I was a young kid and he went, and I was actually starting to tidy my room up. And he came up and he went, tidy your fucking room. And the moment he did that, I went, I'm not going to tidy my fucking room anymore. You know, because he told me to do something I was about to do anyway. And I'm going to be like, fuck you, don't tell me what to do. So it's much more important to empower people, for, to, to, to allow them to make that choice for themselves because then they feel like it's something good that they've chosen to do. But yeah, preach, I mean, we learn those things, but preaching is yeah. still good because you're still educating, you know. Mm -hmm. And there will be still some people that need to hear that on that day. So it's a good start. But yeah, mm -hmm. I um, help people for free. I got amazing results. That's what I was really blown away by. Um, good at it. Um, naturally good at it obviously got a lot of experience in it and, and and coupled that with traditional tools techniques models and frameworks you know that have been around in the coaching industry for decades and started using these models and things that i'd learn and, and stuff like that but i just got it because i'd been there you know people would share their stories and i'd be like oh yeah i remember that one you know and i remember that and, and let me share something with you that i have experienced and and also because i had such a uh, damage, you know, damaged background. Oh, that's probably not the right way of doing it. Such a destructive background. People felt very safe around me, that they wouldn't be judged, because uh, they thought, "Fucking no, this guy's not going to judge me because I've done nothing compared to what he's done." Mm -hmm. So it allowed people to open up to me in a way that, that they'd never been able to open up to people before, and that was really helpful. And um, I was the. I started doing some local networking meetings in Portsmouth, and I, I met up with about four people and had a coffee. And you know, one of them was like an Excel spreadsheet woman, and one of them was something else. And I thought, I'm never going to make any money here. So I started doing the Facebook groups and the online social media stuff. And this was before it was really a thing. Um, you know, I, I started doing my coaching sessions on Facebook video call before Zoom was even a thing. Um, and I and I grew a six figure business quick. Seven months took. And then I moved into sort of digital products, courses, membership sites, hiring team members, and just reinvest in everything. Like everything I earned, I put back in. I took modest amounts of money. I lived a good life, but I never took big chunks, never bought houses or cars. I traveled, Bali, um, yeah, lived, lived off enough money to live, but just put everything into reinvesting into staff and technology and to make the business bigger and better. And um, yeah, within five years, it was valued at $25 million. It's unbelievable. Like, fair play to you. Like, I know you've done a few interviews and people are giving you shit and stick, but I have nothing but respect for you for making those changes for who you are. I don't know if your story is 100% um, offend. I don't know, but I can only judge from who sits across from me. I don't pass judgment on their story but i can make an assumption of do you know what a guy's fucking made his mistakes he's learned from it because i know what it's like to make change it's the strongest people on the planet to then put their hands up and go i need help that's the strongest form for me on this planet it's not sitting in a pub or sitting taking gear or writing negative comments that's a weak link that's somebody who's battling themselves and lost instead of going do you know what why do i need to judge everybody else's story just why do you need to write a negative comment? Do you know what I mean? Just mm. you don't. You can watch something and go, well, I don't like. You, you can say, oh, I don't like that guy, and I don't like that. But it's the vileness that comes from people. When you think, how it's broken the, are you? It's the yeah. It's their own limiting beliefs. It's their own insecurities. I mean, people have, have criticized me for exploiting people, um, just because I've been successful in business. You know, they'll have a, a neg you know a moan at me when I'm a criminal, and I have a moan at me when I'm successful. He's <laughs> like, you can't win uh, against certain people, and. Uh, they they say they think I'm exploiting people because I've, I've made a lot of money. But what they don't realize is a lot of that's in asset value. It's in, the, it's, it's in the company. It's in the business that's helping change the world. It's not my fucking bank. You know, I have stacks and stacks of cash. It's not like I'm living in a fucking mansion or whatever. And I give back to charity. You know, I can't put in a documentary all this stuff about all the charitable work I'm doing because it's just going to look like, you know, it, it, you know, people have already criticized it for being a promotional piece. I mean, I don't quite know why I would put myself as a psychopath and put, you know, people calling me a cult leader in there as a, as a promotional piece but um there is elements obviously that, that highlight some of the good that i'm doing but you know i do lots of charity stuff it's actually a compulsory part of our organization that every single person that works for us has to do charity work every month why because i feel like we should give back like uh there's, there's an element of i don't want to be perceived as that person and i and and i know you know look i'm, I'm just ruefully honest i know that I have to balance it out. You know, if I'm going to make money, I also need to give back because it needs to, we have to be a business that has balance. Um, but also we can give back. So why shouldn't we? And we are about, you know, our mission is about, our tagline is coach your way to freedom. 
to be able to think, say, or do whatever you want without hindrance or restraint, to be able to build a business where you can work from wherever you want and help people. And freedom is the highest value. And we can create freedom for people in the coaching, but also outside. And we've done some amazing work. If you go to our, our website and go to, you know, people don't look at this stuff, but if you go to our website, go to about, there's a whole section on charity and there's dozens of videos of charities we've done all over the world from tree planting to orphanages to things like that yesterday i was in hmp the mount prison and i was doing a talk to the prisoners to help them create a life of freedom after they're released that, that was a prison that i was released from eight years ago you know so I'm, i am doing a lot of good in the world and i've helped change i mean i spoke about the documentary but i've qualified now eight thousand coaches so they are now qualified and accredited coaches that then start their own business that then will then have thousands of clients over their lifetime and the people that they coach will then be in a better place better energy less toxic to be able to support the people around them and then their generations as well so the ripple effect is fucking unbelievable when you think about it, it's millions but of course tabloids media talk tv fucking news bollocks <laughs> you know they they look at they look at all the negatives and they go how can we how can we drag that out you know, the guy that interviewed me and um, started saying all that stuff and he hadn't even watched the documentary. I mean, how can you criticize someone if you don't even know who you're talking to and what it's about? So, um, yeah, there's always going to be a bit of hate and there'll be more to come. And uh, That just means you're doing something right. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, I write enough of us, people who fucking deserve a bit of abuse, pedophiles, fucking nonsense. But yeah, yeah. Is, um, so you've bought out a business, 25 million. What is the business? What is it? How can people get involved? What is it you actually yeah. do if people wanted life coaching? What's the steps and process? How much is that? Yeah, so the main thing we do now is we we help. We, we, we looked at how can we make the biggest impact? And we could have done that, you know, one-to-one -one with coaching, but there's only so much you can do with your time. Plus, we'd rather create an army of coaches that go out and help other people. So what we do is we train coaches. So we are accredited <clears> by the ICF. And we are the training providers that provide people with the tools, the techniques, the models, and the frameworks to be able to actually coach other people. So if you want to become a life coach, it doesn't have to be a life coach, be a confidence coach, mindset coach, business coach, whatever. You come to us and uh, we give you all the training you need to be able to do that. It starts off from $9.99 a month on a membership, and then it progresses to more live and advanced courses, things with workshop facilitators and even virtual reality and all that sort of stuff uh, as an upgrade. But you can get started from $9.99. And that's why when people say I'm exploiting people, I think it's £8 a month, and this is even a 14-day money-back guarantee. You know, How can that be exploiting people? It's like, try it out for eight quid. If you don't like it, cancel it. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not forcing you to give me, you know, your life savings. People to give you your, your life savings. No. Your wages are taking everything off them and yeah. living this. What sort of stuff are you promoting though? Is it for people who are struggling? Is it for people with addiction? No. Is it, what, what is that? I mean, we attract people that have had, this is another thing, that we are um, targeting vulnerable people. And this was in the documentary. For a start, it's impossible to do that. I don't know if you personally know anything about advertising on oh, yeah. social media. You cannot target vulnerable people. You can't even target certain demographics or income brackets or marriage. You know, there's, you used to be able to do things like that. You can't do it anymore. You can't even say certain things. Very difficult to target specific people. There's no way in hell you could say, can you target people that have recently had someone die in their family? It's just, can't do it. Um, but we do attract quite a lot of you could perceive them as vulnerable people if you perceive them as a vulnerable person. I see them as someone who has been through some trauma in their life. And who am I to say, no, 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 you can't come in. You can't be a coach because you've had bad stuff happen in your life and you could be deemed vulnerable. I was vulnerable, you know, but I've been able to turn it into a power. I talk all the time about turning adversity into an asset. And these people have had adversity in their life. And yes, some of them are, have had bereavement. Some people have had trauma. Some people have been sexually abused. And that is the very reason why they want to become a life coach because they've got through it. And they're now passionate about sharing that message. And there are a lot of people that come to us to become a life coach. It doesn't, say, doesn't mean to say we're going, hey, hey, who's been sexually abused? All right, okay, give us your credit card. You know, it's a case of they heard my story. They resonated and connected with it. And they're like, this is something that I want to do. And some of those people do have those symptoms, but I don't personally think that's vulnerable. And I think that's rude to call those people vulnerable. They have their own will. They have their own ability to make decisions. And it's no different from them going to get a degree and spending 40 grand on a piece of paper where they might get a job at the end of it, 30 grand a year. Ours is quicker, more effective, more results driven and more effective in today's market. So if anything, you know, we want to be looking at centralized education and government for the people that are, 
you know, to point the blame at for targeting vulnerable people using the messaging of, you know, you can change your life by going to this university and spending four years on a degree and getting a hundred grand in debt for a job you probably won't get. Or the people that are, you know, advertising the Royal Navy can change your life in the Royal Navy. They don't mention about the fact that you might get killed. So. PTS to you. <laughs> yeah. What makes a good life coach? <sighs> Someone that understands, and that's going to be interesting coming from me, someone that says they've got shallow emotions because, you know, you can be on different ends of the spectrum. Some people can feel more and they have, they're more intuitive and they can more like get a sense of where someone's at. Some people can literally break people's brain apart and, you know, kind of from the language they're giving and the stories they're sharing, they can, you know, make, um, draw conclusions and ask the right questions and take them on a bit of a journey that leads them into a part of their brain that they haven't accessed before. That's kind of the, the approach that I would take. But to summarize understanding people well you know if you understand people well and you understand what they're going through whether that's from personal lived experience or that's from education or from that's using the right tools and techniques because look you don't have to have gone to prison and gone through trauma to be a life coach you can learn these tools and models to be able to you know extract a person you know in extract potential from an individual there's this big misconception in the life coaching industry that a coach is a mentor is someone that gives advice that's helpful and that can be an angle that you use from time to time. But actually a coach is someone that asks challenging and thought provoking questions that allows the client to uncover the answer for themselves. A little bit, a little bit like what I was talking about earlier with the empowerment piece. Um, we want to empower people to you ask them questions and then go, I, I know what I need to do, or I know what I want to do, or oh, I know how to get over this. Um, so understanding people fully and knowing what questions to ask at the right time to allow the client to uncover the answers themselves and get results. How did the Netflix documentary come about? Um, a combination of things, really. There was lots of people involved from the production to directing, to writing, to filming. Um, I'm obviously very entrepreneurial, so I, I was the one that wanted that to happen. So of course I had an influence in trying to pull that together and speak to the right people and make sure that happened. It wasn't like Netflix said, hey, we want to do a documentary on you. Let's commission it. Let's give you a load of money. Um, I had an influence. It's my story. I've got a message to share. Um, but yeah, it was just a, you know, a piece of content that I wanted to get made. I was uh, impartial to it. Like it, it was edited out of my control. I didn't watch the interviews. I don't know what questions were asked on the interviews. Um, obviously I said what I wanted to say. I did have an involvement in some of the edits, um, but I, 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 I wanted it balanced. I wanted it to be fair. I wanted it to be true, raw and authentic. And if the producers wanted me to, to have a certain thing in there, even if it wasn't favorable, I wanted, I was like, cool, do what you think. Um, because yeah, I want people to make their own opinion up on me. I don't want to create a narrative where it's like, this is me. Because no one wants to watch that shit anyway. Uh, it needs to be a bit gritty. But I wanted it to be balanced enough where people can make a decision and not give enough information away to the point where I give people answers. We're living in an age right now where people are starting to understand themselves more than ever and come out about themselves, you know, whether it's the fact that they're gay or bi or whether the fact that it's they're understanding more about their mind, that they're ADHD or they're dyslexia. And neurodivergence and uh, neurodiversity is a big thing. And, you know, psychopathy, for example, or at least personal personality disorders is something that's just not spoken about. And can you imagine if people could speak about it, get awareness around it and go, fuck, that's what I've been living with and be able to channel that out of, you know, destructive behaviors and maybe get out of prison, for example, and start channeling it into something that might help them thrive and help um, make society a better place. So I wanted to spark a conversation around that. And, and, and by giving the answers too heavily, it wouldn't have sparked a conversation, but I'm hoping people start talking out more about, is Lewis a psycho? Was he a psycho? Has he learned to channel that psycho behavior? Am I a psycho? Is psycho even a bad thing? Because it's, one, it's probably one of the only, only mental disorders that's not spoken about and doesn't have this kind of woke mentality about it. I mean, you can call someone a psycho all day long. Even that guy in the interview, he said, I'd rather do that than take advice from a psychopath. Imagine if I said, imagine he said, I'd rather do that than take advice from someone with bipolar. It'd be cancelled like that, wouldn't he? What's the difference? So, yeah, I, I had an involvement and, um, but there was a big team on it, you know. 
as a how's it been for the career is it a positive or a negative i mean it's only new it's a, we did a nice big premiere in mayfair packed that out that was fun um and then launched on netflix went into top 10 so amazing we, it was eight it beat the grinch no it was seventh i think seventh or eighth beat the grinch happy about that fuck you jim carrey no, i'm joking um only because it's November, to be fair. If it was December, I don't think I'd have had a chance of beating the Grinch. But it, but it, top 10. So I was amazed by that. Lot, thousands of messages, all positive. People saying that it's like the first time they've ever related to someone before. Um, you know, so proud of me being able to share the vulnerabilities, similar stories. You know, you would have, you will get the exact same thing. But people don't talk out about this enough. And I think they were quite surprised about how honest I was. And it gave them the hope that they can be honest about what's going on for them. Because uh, a lot of people hold it in shame and obviously that doesn't help anybody. And it's been good. Yes, yeah, brought in customers. Brilliant. Um, it's brought in some publicity. Brilliant. Um, it's brought in some negative publicity. So what? Also brilliant. And I think this is just the start now. So I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from it. And uh, yeah, keep sharing that message and inspiring people and and, uh, and hopefully changing the perspective of of, uh, of people's identity which is ultimately what this comes down to is how they see themselves i saw myself as a bad unlovable kid and eventually a psychopath if you think that you're going to act like that and you're going to be there mm. and the reality is i'm not <clears throat> bad i'm good and i am lovable and i might be a bit of a psycho but it's not always the worst thing <laughs> yeah how has it been a father with a newborn did you have all the old negative traits because did you have a worry that you could have potentially been the same as your own dad no disrespect to your dad but yeah. you know what i'm talking about um i didn't have no i never never thought i would be like my dad because i would make a conscious effort to, to do the complete opposite i had a bit of a fear that i wouldn't bond connect as much as i wanted to and i was really desperate to cry when the baby was born because i thought if i don't then i'm really fucked <laughs> so if i don't cry when my baby's born mm -hmm. then uh, i really am a psycho and i cried so I was like, yes. Um, I think it was also because um, we, we lost a baby as well at 26 weeks. Sorry to hear that. Um, and, and we had to, it was past the stage of kind of abortion or whatever. So we had to give birth to the baby. So we gave birth to a stillborn, had a funeral for, uh, for her and everything. So I was waiting for that scream. And I've been watching the midwife programs and everything. And you know, I was waiting for that scream. I just wanted the baby to come out and scream and be like, yeah. and the baby, and as soon as Ocean, it's his name, as soon as he came out, literally within a fraction of a second, and I was like, ah! so like, emotion release unblocked. Thank fuck, I'm not a full psycho, and also just relief. Um, and it, and it was an amazing feeling. And 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 look, I'll be honest, it was it was a challenge at first. I found it quite overwhelming. I don't know why. Just I guess it's probably quite normal <laughs> with having a child. Um, I, I probably didn't bond as quickly as as maybe some, um, definitely compared to my wife, who's an empath, who's just absolutely obsessed with him, whereas I'm probably not quite, but I feel, I can feel that love and that bond growing day by day, which is lovely to see. Um, so I think it's a journey, fatherhood, he's only 10 weeks old, so we've got plenty of time, but I'm gonna be a good dad, it's my mission. Yeah, good on you, bro. Listen, last question, plans for the future? Well, as I said in the documentary, I want to be a Hollywood actor, um, but that's not, you know, that was a bit more of a superficial sort of jokey. Well, it's not jokey. I'm going to do that. But um, um, one of my, ne my next plans is to create a, a next generation education platform. I've helped coaches, but that's just a, a piece of the puzzle. I want to, I am creating a platform. It's already in the works to create a, a blended learning uh, platform for both children and families where they can learn and co-learn together because there's no point teaching a child something if they're not if it's not being enforced at home and there's no point teaching an adult something if uh, they don't know how to communicate it to their children so it can be this one platform everything that the education system is not providing um it's not going to have necessarily maths or english and stuff in there but it's going to be uh, alternative learning for families that want to thrive in the 21st century so moving out not now out of the coaching industry. I'm very passionate about that. I'm going to continue building my brand and doing all those sorts of things, but I want to create a bigger impact. The education industry is built off the industrial revolution a hundred years ago, and it's just archaic, outdated. It doesn't work. And it's a $1.5 trillion industry. So the business minister inside me is like, there's a problem there, one to be solved. And, um, you know, I've got a long sort of career ahead of me. So I want to see if I can tackle it. For anybody that's watching, it's maybe in a life of struggle just now, doesn't know where, how to get out, what advice would you have for them? Have hope. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. People seem to think that there is no no way out. 
And it takes podcasts like this to inspire people and realize that the change is possible. You know, if there's no belief that there is a way out, then it's just, you're going to feel like you're in this dark hole and there's nothing you can do about it. Understand that there is, there's lots of resources available. If it's addiction, there's drugs and alcohol meetings. If there's anything else that, you know, there's lots of free services, but there's also lots of tools. There's these podcasts, there's YouTubes, there's books. And as long as you actually do absorb that information and implement it in your life, which is obviously key, it doesn't take long before you, 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 your map of the world is changing. Um, so I just say, take, do the work, you know, as uncomfortable as it is, uh, take action and come and join the coaching masters. <laughs> <laughs> How can people get in contact with you if they want to check you out or ask you questions? What's your social media? Yeah. And um, so Lewis Raymond Taylor, I'm the only one in the world. Um, just because it's three first names, a bit weird. So Lewis Raymond Taylor on all platforms. I'm mainly active on Instagram. I answer uh, my messages on there as well. So if anyone's got any messages, drop me on Instagram. And you can check out the Coaching Masters at thecoachingmasters.com. And that's it. Would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? Just been a pleasure to have a, just a general chit chat and uh, not be grilled. And thank you for being uh, positive and inspiring and uh, you know not being one of these clickbaity kind of media you know, controversial prodders that are there to cause drama, mate. I appreciate yeah. it. It's been a really uh, enjoyable conversation. Yeah, listen, fair play to you, mate. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. Good luck to you, the missus and the baby, and I look forward to seeing what you do, brother. God Thanks, bless mate. you. Cheers.